This is America's Roundtable. Visit us at americasrt.com. Follow us on Twitter at americasrt. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Like and share. For those that have just joined us on America's Roundtable, we are joined by John Bundell, who is a distinguished senior fellow of the London-based Institute of Economic Affairs and author of Waging the War of Ideas, Margaret Thatcher, Portrait of an Iron Lady, and Ladies for Liberty, Women Who Made a Difference in American History. Uh, for our listeners, uh, um, John Bundell has known Margaret Thatcher since 1970. John, uh, this year there was quite a bit of attention on the Iron Lady, uh, with the uh, Oscar Award being given to Meryl Streep for her role in uh, the movie uh, The Iron Lady. And uh, when it was being filmed and um, actually uh, edited, uh, there were critics uh, communicating concern about the final product. And um, it was really good to hear your comments uh, during that period of time through uh, news media of what your thoughts were about the movie and uh, Meryl Streep's portrayal of the lady of Lady Thatcher. How would you relay your thoughts on that specific movie and uh, for our listeners that may have not yet seen that uh, movie just uh, was released via DVD recently? Well, I think first of all, you're you quite right to call it a movie. I think people who have been critical of it are thinking that it's not a movie, it's a, docu a documentary. And if it's not a documentary, if it was a documentary, I would be critical of it. It's, it's a movie. Uh, and, and movie makers are free to to take liberties and to, to sort of move history around a little bit, to make it a, a little bit uh, dramatic, if you like, a little bit more dramatic. I think overall it's an excellent movie. Um, I think Street is absolutely brilliant. Um, it's, it's almost eerie. It's stunning in how uh, well she's captured, the, particularly the, the older Margaret, the Margaret age, you know, 86 now. Um, absolutely stunning. Um, and, and, and she well deserved that, that, that Oscar. And the main criticism has been that there's, that Margaret is portrayed as, as an 86-year-old suffering from dementia, and that and, and the movie is a series of flashbacks uh, to her early days um, when another actress plays the early Margaret, age, say, you know, late teens to mid-30s, and then Meryl Streep plays her age, say, mid-40s to mid-60s, as well as playing her age 86. Um, that there's uh, these flashbacks and Margaret is wandering around this house uh, talking to her dead husband, um, Dennis, and thinking he's still alive. Um, and I've given a bit of criticism of that. I think, on reflection, though, it, it, it's, it's okay. You know, you enter, when you enter politics, when you enter public life uh, and put yourself out there, uh, the law of England and in the United States uh, ch changes for you about what can be said by you and about you. And you can't be a public figure for 30 or 40 years and then uh, not expect to somehow become a private figure again. Um, also, I thought the dementia was portrayed quite sympathetically. Um, and it's not as if she's portrayed as being completely um, uh, out of tune with reality. Um, but there are some wickedly funny scenes. There's one, there's one scene where she goes to see where Carol, her daughter, uh, drags her early months early to see the doctor for an annual checkup, and Margaret's very grumpy about this. And after the, um, the doctor's finished the physical uh, checkup, uh, he's doing the kind of uh, asking her a few questions. And um, she's quite clearly lying. She's quite clearly lying to her doctor. <laughs> and and the, um, the telephone rings, and the doctor ignores it, and it rings again, and the doctor ignores it. And the third time it rings, she scowls at him, fixes him with a stare, and she says uh, something like, uh, uh, don't you think you should answer that? After all, it might be somebody who actually needs your help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, blisteringly funny. Uh, if there was a, an Oscar for the best one line of the year, uh, that would certainly get my vote. Um, so I, I, I think overall she comes out of the movie uh, with her reputation enhanced. And Meryl Streep is not known at all for her conservative views. Yet when she was interviewed on 60 Minutes, I think it was, um, she said that um, as, as she made the movie, uh, she came to admire um, Thatcher's qualities, not her policies necessarily, uh, but, but uh, certainly her, her qualities enormously. 
she became a real uh, fan of, 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 of Margaret's personal qualities. Also, one very important topic that we should not uh, forget to mention today is that uh, Lady Thatcher supported the EU. Uh, since the EU was presented to her as, and also to British people at that time as strictly limited to the common market with the free movement of goods, capital and labor. However, it ended being something completely different. And as you mentioned in, in, in the book, as the EU went from a loose trading model toward federalism, she became increasingly uneasy. Could you kindly share with us the details of her views and how did it all evolve? Well, I think you've done a very good job yourself already, Natasha. Um, <laughs> yes, it was presented to us back in the 1970s as uh, a, a, a free market um, trading arrangement and, and, and nothing else, no loss of sovereignty and, and so on. So Margaret, like virtually anybody on the conservative side, um, um, you know, supported it. Um, as things went on, though, it became more and more clear uh, that it was uh, more political rather than economic, and it was, it was a huge uh, transfer of sovereignty. Um, she fought it um, um, quite, quite hard. Um, you have to remember, you see, half her party was very pro the EU, um, so it was very hard for her to keep her party together you know, when so many of them thought that the EU was a, was a good thing. Uh, but she, she fought hard, and um, then uh, in retirement, once she left, once she stood down as Prime Minister and stood down as an MP, um, of course she, she became very um, outspoken uh, about the, the, the dangers of um, transferring too much power to Brussels. And indeed her concerns were right as we look uh, at what's happening in Europe today with the, uh, uh, the Eurozone crisis and uh, I'm sure that a great number of uh, citizens in Britain are certainly delighted of not being in the Euro at this time. Oh yes, very, very much. We were very clever to keep out of the uh, keep out of the Euro, uh, along with a couple of other countries. Um, and of course, the countries that have done well uh, in uh, Europe in the past few years are uh, countries like Norway and Switzerland, which have nothing to do with the EEC or the uh, Euro. Right. That is so true, John. I wanted to actually uh, read a passage from your book, Margaret Thatcher, A Portrait of the Our Lady, uh, which says, Without U.S. support, it is doubtful whether the project of European political integration could have gotten off the ground or developed in the way that it has. Uh, during the 1970s, the success of the project was judged to be sufficiently important to U.S. interests for the CIA to funnel millions of dollars into the European movement. It is difficult to think today, you say, it is difficult to think of a single major issue where the views of the US and the EU are identical. And you continue by saying, recent differences between the EU and the US include those over Iraq, Palestine, Iran, ballistic missile defense, the International Criminal Court, genetically modified crops, the Kyoto Accord, farm support, China, Taiwan, Cuba, and the death penalty, as well as a whole raft of trade issues. John, what do you think are the causes for such a divide between the US and the EU? And how would you answer your own question today? Is the EU America's friend or foe? <laughs> Boy, that's uh, quite a question. It's, it's basically fundamentally a philosophical difference at heart between, although America is, in my view, drifting more toward a, a European model, particularly under the current president, it's, it's fundamentally a, a completely different philosophy at the, at the heart of, of, of Brussels as, as opposed to um, what, what makes America tick, in my view. And I, I don't see any, any soon, any, any, anything in the future that, that, that will resolve that unless the EU uh, begins to um, fall apart, which I, I actually think it, it will. Um, I, I think it will eventually crack. Uh, there isn't a single, uh, just like the Soviet Union cracked, like uh, Yugoslavia cracked. Um, there's never been a, in the history of mankind, uh, a successful 
uh, top-down driven bundling together of different nations uh, like, like the EU uh, transfer of sovereignty uh, to, to some alien capital. It, it will eventually, um, something will happen, and it will eventually um, crack. Uh, there's already, um, roughly two decades now, there's, there's been a, a massive majority of ordinary British people that has wanted um, to opt out of um, nearly everything that the EU stands for. Uh, and eventually something will happen. Uh, the U.S. Constitution starts with we the people, while the EU Constitution that was finally rejected but kind of pushed to the back door, the queen of this country, the king of that country, the sovereign of another country give these rights to the people. So it's a fundamental difference in philosophy and the way these two entities work. Right. It's hard to sum summarize it, but somebody once said something like the following, that, that I think does summarize it quite well, that the European approach is, the American approach is that something is legal as long as it's not made illegal. Uh, whereas the European approach is uh, nothing's legal unless the government has said it's legal. Uh, it's a very different, uh, it's a 180 degree different approach to, to, to how you live your life. Lady Thatcher was concerned about EU's common defence policy and European defence structure, uh, saying it would threaten NATO, it would undermine it, and it would take away the resources from NATO uh, and actually provide for the EU, also helping to create a European super state. So apparently it would dilute the resources that we so much needed concentrated with some hot issues around the world. What are your thoughts about Lady Thatcher's concerns at that time and how do we see them now developing with the current issues in the world? I think she was very prescient. Um, I'm particularly concerned that in recent years um, the EU has moved to make it um, illegal for uh, member countries to have um, their defence requirements met domestically within their, their own country. So every defence contract has to be put out uh, to, um, to bid uh, to all member countries. You're buying your um, bullets from a company in Denmark and um, Denmark disagrees with you going into a, a particular country. They can stop supplying you with the bullets, leading to a situation where individual countries can hold um, could hold you hostage and say, no, we don't want you to, to develop that line of foreign policy, but supply you with whatever, whatever uh, hardware it is that they're supplying you with. Uh, so in the name of the free market um, and a liberal trade policy, uh, they've essentially handed over a defence policy um, to a whole bunch of um, uh, other, other countries. How did Lady Thatcher earn the name Iron Lady? Uh, that came before she was Prime Minister when she made a speech around about 1976 in West London. She made a speech about, about foreign policy in the so so Soviet Union. And um, people in Moscow that branded her an Iron Lady, uh, thinking that it was a, an insult. Uh, Margaret actually loved it. She completely embraced it uh, and started um, talking about herself uh, as the Iron Lady. It was really... Um, that they thought she was insulting her, and uh, she had embraced it and, and worked hard to uh, establish that as, as her, as her uh, nickname, and um, used it often in the speeches for the rest of her life. John, it would be remissive of me not to mention the book that you wrote, which is Waging the War of Ideas. It was some eight years ago that I had the privilege of uh, receiving a copy from you and took time to read that excellent resource. Uh, which, um, in a sense, uh, inspired Natasha and I in, in some of the things that we are involved in. Would you be able to kindly summarize the key elements of the book, uh, Waging the War of Ideas, as you've seen this, uh, working with the great minds, with uh, leaders like uh, Nobel laureate uh, winners like uh, Milton Friedman and uh, F.A. Hayek? I think the single most important lesson to come out of my book, Waging the War of Ideas, is the importance of having what the late Sir Anthony Fisher called an independent station. Uh, whether you're a think tank or a scholar or an intellectual, that you evidence 
that you are independent. I don't trust think tanks, for example, that are affiliated with universities or affiliated with trade unions or affiliated with big companies um, or who accept a disproportionately high amount of money from, from drug companies or oil companies. Um, when I was um, uh, leading the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, England for 17 years, uh, we had a rule that no company could give us uh, more than 1% of our entire budget, so could give us more than 5% of our entire budget. So any time a journalist rang me up to a query, a, a report or a study that we put out and to ask you know, who had funded it, I could hand on heart say, without even looking at the figures, I could, I could say, I could repeat that, that that policy, no company giving more than 1% and no industry sector more than 5%. Uh, and that, that study is a very good step indeed, and that, that was very uh, much respected by the media, uh, that, that we weren't uh, bought. But we, we didn't accept money uh, for restricted restrict money. All the money we accepted were um, in, into our general funds, so that no board research. Uh, so being independent, having an independent station uh, when you're engaged in the war of ideas, I think is absolutely critical. Well said, John. In fact, there is such a debate about capitalism today and socialism is on the rise. Uh, uh, even here on our shores uh, in America, there is a debate about uh, the, the merit of capitalism. However, there is this myth that uh, uh, capitalism has brought uh, out some of the, the worst that we are experiencing today, not realizing that uh, what we have today is crony capitalism and how, unfortunately, special interests have uh, uh, in a sense, as you've mentioned, infiltrated certain groups and, uh, in a sense, uh, brought the importance of liberty. So uh, your book is, a, is an excellent reminder as well uh, of the important role that individuals uh, that uh, appreciate uh, the importance of personal liberty and uh, how this influences policy and academic discussions and uh, how it is so very important to uh, not just only uh, be very comfortable in the academia, uh, but also in our society through popular mediums, uh, whether it be through film or books, um, novels, uh, to see the ideas flourish where it uh, uh, communicates the significance of personal liberty. John, uh, you have written a book entitled uh, Ladies for Liberty, Women Who Made a Difference in American History, and uh, we've heard that you are also working on a new project. and. Uh, would you be open to sharing some of the details with our listeners across America? Yes, I am. Um, following my book on Margaret Thatcher, I was invited to give speeches all over America, which I still do about her. I was struck at how often uh, we would get into the Q&A. Somebody would always say, why haven't we had the Margaret Thatcher in our history? Mm. And I would say, well, you know, America is just stuffed. American history is stuffed with great women. Uh, you've got more great women in American history than any other nation on earth. And I would start mentioning names, and quite a lot of names I would mention, people were just blank. I could see blank faces. And um, so uh, one day my, my youngest son, James, uh, challenged me to, to write a book about all my uh, favorite uh, women in American history. And it came out um, late last year. It's called Ladies for Liberty, uh, Women Who Made a Difference in American History. It starts with Mercy Otis Warren, uh, who was the conscience of the revolution and uh, goes through people like Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, the Grimke sisters of, of South, South Carolina, who were uh, great abolitionists, uh, people like Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and Madam C.J. Walker, the entrepreneur, and uh, about 20, uh, 25, right up to uh, people like Rose Friedman, uh, and Jane Jacobs, and Ayn Rand. I'm, I'm currently working on a second edition that will come out next year, adding uh, more ladies, people like... Uh, Mildred Loving, uh, Rosa Parks, uh, Anne Hutchinson, uh, Alice Paul, uh, and so on. So um, we're working on a second edition right now. John, we look forward to your new book coming out next year. And uh, we certainly thank you for taking time out of your schedule and joining us on America's Roundtable. Thank you, John. Well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.